we are ready to get started with arguably the session I'm most excited about for the whole conference, which is to get a sneak peek at some things you've been doing with the stimulus funds. So you're going to hear again from Madison Bowles, and then she's going to be joined by uh, Dennis Nangle, one of our other program officers. Dennis has been with the Grants to States program for six years, and before that in a state library. And he's always surfacing great work that shows you know, your impact and all the value that you bring as you administer these federal funds. So he's a great perspective to bring to this uh, presentation in particular. And he and Madison are gonna tag team at the outset and then we're hoping to hear from you. So I'll turn it over to Madison. Thank you, welcome back. All right, well, our ARPA highlight session is brought to you by you. Because of all of the ARPA extensions uh, that we've all had, we do not have a readout on SPR reports uh, for this for this conference, uh, and we don't anticipate to have them for some months now, as you all know with your extensions. Uh, so what we wanted to do today is do an early snapshot of the impact of the ARPA grants and the many projects that it funded. Uh, we originally dreamed that this session would be you presenting your own slides, but considering the time restraints, uh, what we're going to do is that Dennis and I have chunked out uh, all of the slides that were given to us into general categories, uh, and we will pre present them uh, in according to those categories. And many of you did so much work, and they don't they don't fit perfectly neatly into these categories, uh, but you, you'll be able to see all the work that people have done. Um, we want to do that within the next 30 minutes, and then for the remainder of the time, we want you to ask questions, provide extra insight on the projects that may have been featured, uh, you know, talk more about what you did that maybe wasn't on the slide. Um, not everyone submitted a slide, which was totally okay. Thank you to those who did. Um, so if you didn't submit a, a if you did not submit a slide, feel free to talk about uh, some of your projects as well that may relate or not. Um, we just want to hear all the great work that that you're doing. Um, so thank you for taking the courage to manage these extra funds in this in the scope of an emergency, no less. All right, Dennis is going to start us off. Thank you, Madison. So our first um, category is hotspots and technology upgrades. And so um, again, I will be speaking very quickly and abbreviatedly. I recommend taking the time to read through these on your own with the um, slides that are provided on the website. But Alabama did a lot um, in a technology upgrade arena with their ARPA funds, um, giving 180, 198 public libraries and 66 out of their 67 counties, different um, pieces of hardware and software. Um, and what's really interesting is they developed a pilot hotspot lending project, which um, 144 hotspots and over 124 terabytes of data within the project period. And this also served as a pilot for a discretionary grant that they also ended up getting on the discretionary side. And they're tired and understandably so. Uh, Louisiana also, again, I'm highlighting the tech tech um, elements of these bullets. There's a lot of digitization that was happening. They bought hundreds of computers. Um, they bought a drone. Uh, and they uh, overall, the outcome was um, more and better access to everything that the state library had and people knowing what was going on in Louisiana. In Montana, um, they, they were really focused on broadband connectivity amidst the pandemic, which was a, another one of our kind of um, leading key areas of focus for ARPA. So we were really excited to see that. Um, again, there's a lot of great detail in here, but they did a lot of Wi-Fi upgrades, cabling installation, um, uh, hotspot borrowing. And this one example is um, this one library that went from a download speed of 30 megabits per second to 423 megabits per second. Um, and again, that, that uh, soundbite from somebody who is homebound who was able to benefit from the hotspot is just really, really great stuff. And in Washington, the state that we are in right now, um, they at, they gave of the ARPA funds 2.4 million in subgrants, and then 1 million of, of the 
ARPA funds were for new Wi-Fi and a technology consortium for smaller libraries, which we thought was really great. And for those of us that made the trek to the talking book um, and Braille library, um, they also spent funds on um, a memory kit uh, for people with low vision, low vision patrons with dementia. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Madison. Thank you. I'm going to be talking about digital training, which occurred very often in many states, and uh, Connecticut was one of them, and they focused on digital inclusion. Uh, they had a 13-month uh, digital navigation project in four different public libraries, which led to Connecticut libraries and partners uh, creating more space for digital equity, which is really awesome. Uh, they, they enlarged the digital inclusion ecosystem in the state. Um, and inspired other libraries and their boards to sustain those digital navigator projects moving forward. Uh, next, we have Massachusetts. Uh, they provided staff training to make sure their digital materials and communications were accessible, uh, which we've learned is a very valuable skill to have. And they've even uh, polled the, the attendees and 98% folks agree that applying these types of skills will help them improve their library services in general. Next, we have Oregon. Uh, they focused on digital literacy instruction and have been hosted events such as Family Tech Nights and had a mobile virtual reality lab. Uh, and on the, the, in the scope of human services, uh, they helped folks with eviction protection and community education, which we all know was particularly important during the pandemic. Then we have Tennessee. Uh, for their digital training, they utilized 187 subawards uh, and hired an instructional designer to create online trainings uh, within their uh, Tell Academy, their Tennessee Electronic Library. Uh, and as we all always need our additional e-materials. Mm -hmm. And next we have Hawaii who worked with a partner, Alulike, which is a nonprofit that supports uh, Hawaiian natives. And they worked on a digital storytelling project, which not only helped preserve the local oral histories, but it also engaged families to use uh, technology. And then we have Washington, DC. Um, the DC public invested in their digital navigator program as well and made more mobile devices available to their users. Uh, additional things were air filters and self-checkout machines, which were important during the pandemic. And as a lessons learned for them, which I'm sure is a lessons learned for me and for everybody else, additional funds are really valuable, but it takes a lot of planning to spend them. All right. Oh, I have Texas too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Texas utilized subgranting as well in 127 subawards, and they had a digital navigator program and a telehealth program during the pandemic. And finally, with Rhode Island with digital training, uh, they offered statewide digital literacy classes as well as updating technology uh, in, in their libraries. Uh, they awarded 140 grants, uh, subawards without a grants management system. Uh, so kudos to them for that. And overall, uh, their ARPA funding led to an increase in state funds for digital resources, which is a great outcome. Right, Dennis? Category is vehicles. <laughs> so our first state is Michigan. Um, they, uh, their entire ARPA allotment was dispersed in grants. Um, and some of them were content materials, but uh, we wanted to highlight here the one rural library that um, used funds for a hybrid golf cart bookmobile. Um, and it was done locally by a local fabricator and it's sort of become the talk of the state. Uh, it seems to be an emerging model for um, other, other, he might be, oh yeah, he is now a full-time bookmobile maker uh, because of the ARPA funds. In Missouri, um, again, focusing on the vehicle theme, they, uh, University City used ARPA funds for an electric tricycle, uh, which is a tiny bookmobile. It's human powered, but it has electric assist. And just because it's too good not to bring up, even though it's not related to vehicles, um, recently the Missouri State Library 
supported um, Excel Adult High School, and they recently had a graduation ceremony that had over 100 graduates. In Mississippi, um, they did a lot. Um, Peep the IMLS attribution on the app there, which we love to see. Again, not VO correlated, but too good not to highlight. Um, in the vehicle realm, they uh, purchased a tech van for their staff to travel to public libraries throughout the state um, because the Mississippi State Library in particular is um, really a key infrastructural piece for tech support throughout the state. And in South Carolina, yep, that's still me, uh, they gave over 100 subgrants, totaling $1.3 million. And again, in the vehicle theme, they a lot of those subgrants involved bookmobiles and a book bike, um, which is really um, helpful, especially with um, access and getting out to the community after the pandemic. And a lot of other great stuff, too, and a lot of paperwork. <laughs> And in Wisconsin, again, a lot of great, really diverse, varying projects. Um, in the uh, vehicle realm, they have a they supported the Spooner Memorial Library purchasing a Biblio Dragon bookmobile. Which, um, if you click on that link on the electronic version, you can see the sweet van art that is dragon based. So it's it's very impressive. Um, but then they also worked in the realm of uh, creating safe safe libraries and safe spaces. Um, and installing lending libraries in a lot of community centers also. Take it, oh, nope, take it away me. I'm in the next theme. Uh, <laughs> and this is related to um, projects that related to furniture and outdoor um, library spaces. So Arkansas also did a ton. Um, and this was their first time awarding subgrants. So that's always a huge undertaking. And they did so many different things, uh, supported a lot of book lockers and a lot of um, support for outdoor programming materials and furniture, photos of which they helpfully provided in the SPR, which were very nice. Thank you. Uh, and then also in the furniture and outdoor support program was Nebraska. Um, out of their uh, 450,000, they had competitive subgrants. And so they were furniture was really popular need. Um, and as you all probably can sympathize with, was hard to get. But um, they still supported a lot of projects that, that helped create outdoor spaces um, and things like that. And it was hard to get reports from rural libraries who have one librarian, which also makes sense. Now I'm going to take it away or give it over to Madison. This category is science and STEAM. A Arizona, AZ, did, did some amazing work, which is shown in this really awesome pie chart, and it includes distributing STEAM learning kits and items, including telescopes and coding kits. And a cool outcome that they highlight here is that after ARPA, some entities who had never applied for a suburb before applied for their first time. So we applaud Arizona on their outreach. Next, we have South Dakota. Uh, they worked with their state parks um, and funded Pentworthy and citizen science kits. They also used funds for technology, equipment, and uh, which included a scanner and an over an overdrive consortium books. Um, also a great pie chart. We love to see a chart. <laughs> All right, now we have Utah. Uh, Utah's, uh, among their favorite projects was a hydroponic gardens, uh, which was located in food desert and they had digital skills classes. Um, some overall lessons, which I think are pretty valuable, are that they recommend surveying libraries uh, so they can be more direct and intentional with what they fund and what they need. Um, and they also uh, learned that using, using challenges as opportunities to get a seat at the table in larger conversations. And now we're back to Dennis. Category is? school support to school libraries or other types of libraries. So Alaska, again, did a great number of things with their ARPA funds. Um, they supported not only libraries, but museums, which was um, a helpful kind of um, directive we gave with the ARPA funds. So that was really cool to see. And school libraries. And a lot of it had to do with um, the ARPA funds were there to diversify their collections to um, help reflect the community. Um, and, and yeah, so that was the, the school centric things, but they, 
they also recognized that it was very stressful um, and a lot of projects weren't completed during the grant period, which um, our um, bevy of extensions can attest to. Uh, next is Colorado. Again, they gave a lot of subrecipient grants. Um, you can see kind of how the, the funds break down, but I just want to highlight here that of the of the recipient types, um, 122 of those grants totaling over $964,000 went toward school libraries. And similar to Alaska, a lot of it was about doing diversity audits of collections and diversi diversifying the collections. And in Wyoming, again, more uh, collection development support for school libraries, which seems to be an exceptionally, what's always a high need in school libraries, but it seems like post pandemic even more so. And so um, throughout the state over, uh, not over, but 208 school libraries benefited and added more than 15,000 physical and electronic materials. So, and then another great soundbite that I can't read right now out loud for time, but it's really good. Uh, Vermont also, again, uh, we're seeing a lot of trends with support to schools with collection development. And so they uh, created welcoming library collections uh, for the larger community, not just school libraries. They had um, supported funding for translating um, introductory materials about what a library is for people from other countries, immigrants, refugees, who just don't even understand the concept of an American public library. Still me. Uh, New Mexico. Also, uh, not there were some school library recipients, but as far as like the, the um, atypical non-public support, they uh, something of note here. There's a lot of good content on here, but I want to point out that they really did a lot of work to make sure that they could support the Navajo Nation Library. They were initially had a barrier because they couldn't accept direct funding, but they were able to be a purchasing agent and as a state library. And so they worked with supporting the Navajo Nation in a kind of an indirect way, but still was able to meet the need of, of that community, which I thought was really notable. Another great soundbite about the impact of the maker, uh, sewing machine installed in a maker space that I recommend reading. Oh yeah, where do we go? Um, uh, Hector actually brought this up in his um, some of his project overviews was how much they support in Puerto Rico the um, school libraries. And so not only did they support them in a lot of different ways with uh, funding, but they also did a lot of on-site workshops uh, for school librarians to, um, to be as an ally and enhancer of student learning. So they had six um, hour on, they had a six hour on-site workshop and 144 librarians participated. And then Indiana, yes, Indiana. Um, they also did a lot of different types of subgrants. Uh, they distributed 74% of their $3.47 million in subgrants. Um, and 71% of that went to individual libraries, which is great. And um, and yeah, so they were they break <laughs> they break down the good and the not so good. Uh, I, I see that kind of unconventional uh, story walk support, which we've been seeing a lot of with ARPA with ARPA projects. But um, again, they they reflect the challenges of the supply chain affecting affecting the deadlines. Take it away, Madison. Our next category is needs assessments and analyses. Uh, Iowa contracted with a social work professor to conduct a needs assessment to identify strategies to help patrons with psychosocial needs. That includes mental health, substance abuse, homelessness, and, and po poverty-related needs. And uh, this, this uh, contractor was said to assess gaps in libraries' ability to meet those types of needs. Uh, the recommendations from the assessment were put into their five-year plan, and they are now seeking grant funding to, to pilot a program that they've titled Building Public Library Capacity for Serving High Needs Patrons. And the intent for that is creating a toolkit for other states to address similar needs. And next we have Ohio. Uh, Ohio did a collection analysis through teaching books. They focused on youth collections and that included toolkits, live support and webinars. And what we've learned that this slide is already out of date. They've reached 88 of 88 Ohio counties. Ooh. 
And that's been more than 630 collections uh, that have been analyzed. And there's also interest uh, in replication of this analysis in other states. Dennis, you're up next. Category is partnerships. So the ARPA funds in North Carolina, again, uh, there was a, a broad scope of, of outcomes and support that they provided throughout the state. Um, they saw a lot of increasing circulation of other technologies. Um, but what's nice is that these funds, as you probably can also relate to, were sort of like a, a spark or a catalyst for continuing to seek funding to fulfill um, the need for internet access far beyond ARPA. Um, and a lot of, I think Utah mentioned, having a seat at the table with these challenges. And that's what North Carolina also indicates here is that the funds help strengthen the community partnerships and understand the role of the state library. In New York, they also did a lot of, of partnering with um, various state um, agencies and other, other organizations. They worked on a lot of digital inclusion work, um, most notably a digital literacy for seniors um, using um, Senior Planet. And, um, and they partnered with a lot of museums as well with STEM workshops that had a diversity and equity um, awareness emphasis. Um, and yeah, and then they did uh, some work on partnering with schools for digital resources for students, particularly social and emotional learning. And in Oklahoma, um, they had targeted grants, but they were, it allowed each recipient to address their specific needs. So the, the projects were very broad and really varied. Um, you see the partnership with the community center and the library that created an outdoor learning space. And uh, again, there's a lot of good stuff in here too, but I just wanna point out the partnership with the Standing Bear Park Museum and Education Center that you see in the photo. Um, it During the pandemic, they used the funds to help create a website so folks could virtually tour the museum while things were shut down. You now. I'm bringing us home with workforce development. Uh, California, they provided six digital workforce platforms to all of their public libraries in the state with over 374,000 lessons completed. Uh, they also funded the Digital Navigator program with uh, partners uh, with over 50 library in partners in over 50 library jurisdictions. Uh, they created home connectivity kits, which included Chromebooks and hotspots. And they also provided free ebooks and audiobooks through the Palace Project. Next, we have Illinois uh, with workforce development. Uh, they had 30 sub awards on virtual employment programs and related resources, as well as helping to accommodate online learning and working remotely. Lord knows we all needed those skills. Um, <laughs> they had subawards that helped libraries comply with pandemic protocols and to bring people back into libraries. Uh, so they could uh, bringing back people into libraries using those protocols. And finally, uh, the Millstep Public Library put up an enclosure on a trailer hitch to help uh, create a sort of little free library uh, that had access uh, for one family at a time to encourage social distancing. Next, we have Minnesota. Uh, they had a career force contract to enhance workforce grants in their state. And they also had a parenting project with the Minnesota Department of Corrections. And finally, we have New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey worked on digital literacy um, in workforce development, emphasizing computer skills and job seeking. Uh, they also focused on digital inclusion for their projects. And a quick shout out to their New Jersey Health Connect program. Uh, this is an ongoing uh, program uh, to put a spotlight on the inequities of the healthcare system. Uh, it's technology that offer, offers links to telemedicine apps uh, for doctor's appointments, which is helpful through the COVID pandemic and beyond. All right, we got through them. Woo! Thank you so much for submitting your slides. Now we would like to hear from you. You can use the microphones here in either end of the room. If you have questions for other states, questions for us, if we miss something in your slide that you wanna highlight, uh, we'd love to hear it. So 
now I have to stand on my tippy toes. <laughs> so North Dakota, I don't know why this went over my head, but it did. Didn't get my slides in. Um, we created 10, um, we purchased 10 book vending machines to put around the rural areas of North Dakota. We started first where there were no countywide library services offered. And then we went to underserved communities. We have um, two left that we are still waiting to place. Um, we did, we put one in a park system. And so one in a, a grocery store, community grocery store. So um, we're really excited about that. It has taken a lot of work. And um, our two catalogers have cataloged 8,000 books oh that we purchased for the vending machines. Um, each vending machine has 400 books. So we got an initial, an, an initial collection for each and then a second round of collections. And we also saw um, an academic consortium uh, start up in with overdrive, we oversaw that and got them going with um, a collection just for a starter. So those are a couple of things. We, we weren't able to submit a slide, but one of the really important um, projects that several libraries did in our state of Idaho were to get bookmobiles. Um, Idaho is largely rural. A lot of it is even beyond rural. It's just remote. Um, those are places that people don't have internet. They, they don't have access to healthcare. Um, it's not easy for them to drive to a library or maybe their school library may be the closest library. Um, so I think those projects have been hugely impactful for the communities and um, they just never would have been possible without this type of funding. So kudos to the IMLS and um, we're just very happy and delighted to see how those projects have turned out. Thank you. Madison, I have a few extra details oh. from Rachel Cook. Yes, Rachel. Um, a little more detail on our hydroponic gardens. When we surveyed our public, public school and academic libraries, the overwhelming community need they reported was food insecurity. We couldn't pay for food with grant funds. No, we may not. Um, <laughs> so we partnered with the STEM Action Center that was doing these gardens in schools to improve access to fresh food in some of our most rural areas. It is one of my favorite projects we have ever done. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Brenda from South Dakota. And um, South Dakota does not do subgrants. So I want to just give a shout out to everybody who does because wow that was a lot of work it's not something we've ever done before and we decided if we ever did do it again we would purchase software to do it but wow to, to those of you who do sub grants that's a lot of work <laughs> <laughs> so uh i spent the last three years building an egms and i think that we could not have done the arpa grants that we did that we were handling 140 grants it was insane uh, without that EGMS. And I mean, I think we could have done it, you know, on multiple spreadsheets, but th there's so much more human error that's possible when you manage grants that way. So I was really grateful for that. The state of Maryland uh, in the, the spirit of being sort of economical in the number of grants, we awarded large grants. So we did what a lot of y'all did too. And that was, we gave out 14 vehicle grants uh, and my boss had this great statistic. It will, it will be in the SPR. Uh, but basically, since a lot of these vehicles went to rural communities, their outreach is, I forgot who said that. Yes, you. 
their, the outreach is significant and measurable. So it's, it's between 25 and 40% more of the state of Maryland is being reached by these outreach vehicles. So that in, is, in and of itself, I thought was like a really valuable ARPA lesson. And thank you. So in Rhode Island, we, we did more than was on this slide, but I have been really grateful for the libraries themselves in the administration of this funding. Although we did learn that some of our library directors are not so good at doing things like accounting and, you know, like <laughs> attachments and uploading things. Um, they were incredible, especially because we didn't have a grants management system. So we were, just, we were using spreadsheets. We built something sort of ad hoc and we kept changing it with every round. Our libraries were so creative and they were so patient and they were so willing to try things and spend the money and like work with us to get all of it out the door. And um, I really think that this has been sort of a well, maybe not once in a lifetime, hopefully, maybe once in a lifetime, but a really great opportunity to infuse our libraries with, uh, you know, we got a lot of new technology and a lot of really innovative projects that people did with our competitive grants. And it was just a, a challenging, but very rewarding experience in the end. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any more virtual content? Comments? None? <laughs> well, if no one else would like to add, I think I can speak for all three program officers where we are greatly appreciative of the work you've done with ARPA. Um, I can speak for all of MLS, I can tell you that. Uh, with this extra work and we look forward to reading your SPR reports when they do, when they are due. So, thank you. Thank you. Well done. Great job, everyone. Great job, Madison and Dennis for that whirlwind tour of our ARPA sneak peek. And now we're gonna continue the theme of ARPA and add in CARES. Last year's conference in Baltimore had us talking about your experience going through CARES and ARPA, whether it was something the IMLS evaluation team would think about investing money in to do more of a on the side research study. Your conversation with us was the first opportunity we had to really discuss that. Um, and like so many things, uh, Emily took up the baton and is actually going to make this next step a reality. So we're going to hear from her a year later on evaluating CARES and ARPA. Hey, it's me again. Nice to see you. Um, this time I get a bonus 15 minutes instead of a minus 15 minutes. So I'll just talk really slow. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know I, I do, I do always appreciate a little bit extra break, but I'm of course going to make you do a little work before you get that break. So um, I'm going to, some of what I'm going to show you is going to be a refresh of what you saw last year. We've talked about this a number of times. Um, I think the real important takeaway that we want to share with you today is that of the evaluation funds that we're putting towards the stimulus dollars that IMLS delivered, um, we're putting it all towards the work that you did. So no pressure. Um, we ended up expending the majority of our stimulus funds through the grants to states programs. The structure really did help IMLS efficiently get money out the door. Uh, and so we want to be able to talk about that. We want to be able to study that and understand what that meant and what that looks like. I'm going to take a step back for a second because I was sitting 
um, with PLA, the Public Library Association, at the beginning of the pandemic and helped with the, both the March and the May surveys that we sent out to libraries across the United States, including state libraries, to ask kind of that future anticipation. What's going to happen? What, are we, what do we think? our budgets are going to look like in this pandemic? What do we think is going to happen to our structures? What do we think is going to happen to our libraries? What are our greatest fears? What are our greatest needs? And I was just refreshing. Um, I remember looking at the data at, in, in my spare bedroom in my house in late at night in the dark with, you know, like data just coming out of my ears. Um, and there is this Really, there is this sense across the board, and especially at the state level, early on, that a lot of what you all were going to experience in this crisis was going to be a repeat of what happened in the 2008 recession. And in 2008, in the 2008 recession, so many state libraries were gutted, and then it took so long to be able to hire state, back, state staff back, to be able to reinvigorate your budgets, to be able to get yourselves at the level that you were when the pandemic hit. And so I remember just kind of having this reflective thought overwhelmingly that there was this real fear that, that you were gonna lose your jobs, that your state libraries were gonna be targeted, um, that you were just gonna be wiped out because of tax revenue losses, and that libraries would, your public libraries in your states would experience a lot of the same things. And to listen today, to have you, at, by the way, everyone's hiring. So, you know, raise your hand if you have a job. Um, first of all, that's telling, right? The fact that like you're all in a position where you're able to start hiring people, even if you lost people early on, a lot of that rehiring didn't happen for a number of years after 2008, based on my recollection of what I remember public libraries talking about when I first started at PLA. Um, you know, there was also like the, there were funds, you were able, were able to get funds from the feds to your states, to your libraries that really helped stabilize a lot of places that just believed they were going to be shut down. And, you know, people, the, the sentiment that I got out of the comments that were coming through is fear of, of what was going to happen to the communities because the libraries closed their doors, fear at the state level of what you were not going to be able to provide your local libraries. And we're in a position now where we're hearing we got a ton of money, we need to take a breather. <laughs> um, we're still trying to get the money out the door, but that's a very different scenario that, than what I think a lot of us were anticipating when March 2020 rolled around and we didn't know what was happening. The, we asked states in the May, we actually did a division of um, data by state, academic, K-12, and public libraries in the second survey that PLA did. And we asked libraries what they needed the most from their state organizations. And they said they needed help communicating value, getting funding, and getting guidance on how to manage the pandemic. And I'm going to let you, I'm going to leave the guidance in the kind of political realm over here, depending on who you're like what your legislature looks like. But when we look at all of the work that you did with the ARPA funds and the CARE funds, CARES funds, I feel like IMLS is so able to articulate value of what you all were able to do and what public libraries were able to do with these funds very quickly. And we haven't even gotten all the data in yet. And I think that's really telling in terms of um, just the, the want to be able to really invigorate libraries at a time when there was a lot of uncertainty and a lot of fear. And if you all even just being in your positions, um, give yourself just a little bit of recognition, if not a lot of recognition for helping to advocate to get the funding that you got for your states. Um, we're, you know, we can go back and we can start looking at some of the data from early on and say, way to go. Like you guys didn't just administer the funds 
your knowledge, your experience, your want to help your libraries really did help us be able to get you funds that weren't around in, the, in a recession that had a really negative impact years ago. Um, you all also said that for states, look, just looking at the state level data, 12, we had 12 state responses, so about a 25% 25 25 response rate. Um, you all said that, that you had concerns that you were not gonna be able to hire people. Still seems to be a concern. Again, everyone's got a job opening somewhere out there, um, but that your hiring was gonna get just nixed, that you were gonna have this great need and you wouldn't even be able to hire people. You said that you were concerned about your funding dropping for professional development and print collections. Um, you anticipated money, losing money on programs and resuming operations, but you did anticipate money going up for services. And what I, you know, think, th again, thinking about now, like we had a lot of money go into professional development when we look at the CARES and ARPAS funds. We had a lot of money going into helping libraries shift into that virtual space when they couldn't have people in person or getting out in the communities through the bookmobiles or the virtual or the um, you know one-off library structures, temporary libraries. I think print collections, I'll just kind of leave that one there. Um, I think there's a lot more to print collections changing than just the pandemic, but that certainly accelerated, I think, a lot of shifting from print to digital. digital. So I know this isn't, it wasn't an IMLS study. Um, I should, of course, in my like due diligence of uh, caring about research and statistics, um, this wasn't something that we sent through a statistical package and can say with def definitive uh, assurance that all of these data are correct. Um, but when, even now, like going back, thinking back years later, um, I think a lot of what we found in those surveys through the Public Library Association really did, really is going to give us a good opportunity in the evaluation, in retrospect, to say what is it, what is it that people were most afraid about? How are we able to help divert some of those fears? How are we able to support libraries staying open and then help support their communities? Um, so I, with that, I will... Get off my soapbox, just give yourselves a pat on the back, congratulations, uh, and we'll get on to the rest of our scheduled program. The evaluation itself, um, like any good evaluation, if you are still traumatized from the evaluation you did from your last five-year plan, uh, you'll know that you're, we're going to go through all of the documentation. We're gonna look at all the data and we're gonna ask ourselves, what did we do well and what could we do better? Um, that means that we will be coming to you for data collection. You are our primary data collection targets. Um, but fortunately, we are gonna have a lot of data already collected, like what we just saw uh, Dennis and Madison present in the slides, which you're already reporting into the SPR. We're gonna be going in there, we're gonna be dissecting it and looking at it. Uh, left, right, and upside down, um, with the idea that at the end of it, we're gonna get an evaluation report that's gonna talk about not only what we found in the distribution of value, evaluation funds, but our hope is that it's gonna talk about that value add that I just shared with you as my own personal reflection. Um, we know that state lawmakers are looking very closely at how stimulus funds were spent in their states. And we want to be able to give you data points to be able to talk to your legislators and talk to your federal staff, as well as ourselves when we're talking about the way we were able to move funds from IMLS out into communities. Just to reiterate uh, the wonderful message that Terry shared about trying to prevent further extension requests. Um, we do want to start the evaluation sometime this year. So um, it would be of great benefit to myself as someone who likes data to have all the data in. So um, I would also very much appreciate it if you were able to 
close everything out, but we'll work with what we got. The idea being that we'll have a report uh, about a year and some change out. This, again, many of you have already seen, for the five of you that were on this side of the room who weren't here last year, this might be a new slide for you. Um, this is where, this is CARES dollars, right? So this is the very first chunk of money that went out the door. This is what that distribution looks like. Um, again, thinking back to what we heard libraries needing early on, like these hot, the hot spots showed up here and throughout that digital access piece became really important. Um, you know, we, we had to shift, the field had to shift very suddenly. And that just meant these, this is, I think really speaks to the demand of where um, the library, the libraries needed to shift to be able to provide services. Uh, these are the areas that we tended to see the, pro the types of projects being funded. Um, connectivity again shows up at the at the top, including well, including internet upgrades, digital content, workforce, PPA, PPE sanitizing, learning kits. This would be by count of um, activity, and then this would be at the state level. So where did states um, invest their funds and cares? Last June. Uh, when we were in Baltimore, we asked LST coordinators and chiefs about the stories you were most interested in if we were to do an evaluation. How did you want to be involved? What is it that would be good for you? And what might be some topics or things that we would want to be more, that might be more politically sensitive that we should be aware of? We then met in December with COSLA shared some of what we heard from you at the June conference, um, that you wanted further discussions on administering stimulus funds during an emergency, uh, and that that post-recovery story from the state's perspective seemed really important. Um, I'm a lessee, this is a great opportunity to leverage our state federal partnership, uh, but we also really heard that what you wanted would be assets that you could use, PowerPoints, um, one pagers, things that you could pull really quickly off of the internet that would, that would look nice and tell a really quick story of what your state did or what we did at the national level. And so we've taken the feedback we've got, gathered so far, drafted these research questions here. This is what's going to start to go into our um, evaluation uh, scope of work that we will pull together and then send out to bid, have an evaluator come to us and tell us um, how they might be able to run this evaluation. And we'll focus on the different ways the funds went out the door, technology access, and then those lessons learned. We have, we have some hypotheses that we're gonna be testing. Uh, we certainly heard from COSLA in December that just because we had, that the CARES ACT dollars did not necessarily mean that ARPA dollars were easy to administer. Um, so some of these hypotheses were already starting to get a little bit of feedback on that might, they might need to be tweaked. Um, but that's of course also what we're gonna be testing in the evaluation. I'm, per I'm personally very interested in the idea of centralized purchasing or states shifting towards grant programs. Um, having worked in other industries where there are formula grants that go out the door. This is a this tends to be a pretty centralized system where money can move relatively quickly. Um, and that might not show up in an example of like HHS or Department of Ed, where there might be more com complicated ways that the funding is distributed. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be really interested to see how that one comes out for us. And we also know that um, the museums have been really interested to hear how well these efficient, how efficiently these funds went out the door from their perspective, wanting to know um, what the opportunities would look like in the future on the other side of the IMLS house. So with that, we're going to turn it over to a discussion. Um, we have two different table discussion questions that we're going to ask. And the first is, 
we don't want to know what you want to know. We want to know, we want you to think of yourself as an evaluator. So you just got done with your five-year evaluations. You worked closely with evaluators. They were asking you questions. They were asking for data. They were asking you to remember things from before the pandemic that none of us can remember. Um, and so if you were evaluating this program, what would you, what would you like need to be looking for? What is it that you as a data collection specialist would be looking for? So there's definitely going to be some like, well, evaluators need to know that we did X. Evaluators need to know that we did Y. That's going to show up for sure. But do evaluators need to be interviewing every single library? Do evaluators need to be surveying state level staff only? What would you be asking of states in terms of function? Like, where do you want them to really target their energy? We have limited dollars, you know, go to evaluate every single thing and you don't want them to evaluate every single thing um, just because you would, it would never end. So what would you ask of, of yourselves um, if you were an evaluator? What, would, what do you think you'd look for in the data? What would be really compelling for trend analysis? Um, and what topics or activities would be important to focus on in a research plan? And maybe you feel like we've identified those already. Maybe the answer is what you put up on the slides. But I have a feeling from your, from your perspective, um, there's probably some things out there that you would want to make sure that if we are putting money behind an evaluator going out into your communities, going out into your state, coming to you and asking for information, you would want to make sure we got covered. So we're going to spend hmm, about 10 minutes just talking at tables. If it seems to wind down before then, um, we'll do the report out. Um, again, don't overthink this. This isn't, you aren't getting graded. <laughs> who aren't getting tested. Um, this is just really like, think, think like a researcher. If you're researching what happened during the CARES and ARPA with the CARES and ARPA stimulus funds, what is it that, that you should be looking at? Sound good? Okay, go to it. I will find you in about 10 minutes. Okay, which one of you gets the mic? All right, okay. Um, we're gonna do our round robin. So I'm gonna go that direction to the virtual people and then come back down this way, just so you know where I'm going next. So. Start over, <laughs> wherever. <laughs> okay, um, at our table, when we were, things that we would be interested to look at from other states uh, was the number of states that really focused on whether funds were going to direct service or looking into the language of the surveys themselves and seeing how many had very direct actionable goals where it said we are going to distribute hotspots or we are going to do xyz as opposed to what some states did i'm not pointing a finger at our state but our state would be a great example um where you see a lot of um very vague uh, goals that have big keywords and big concepts, and that's not a bad thing, but we do that so that we can kind of cram projects in there as we think about them or if we need to, but it's much harder to go in after the fact and say, hey, look, you want to see what we're doing with this money. This is exactly how it's going. So to look at the, the surveys and see really what ones, what, stand up? Hi. Um, <laughs> now that I'm almost done. So uh, we would be really interested to see what states had those actionable goals um, at a higher level and what states were making that move. And then the other thing we had noticed is um, we would be interested in seeing how many states made a noticeable shift in their goals, because I know when we talked about this in Baltimore last year, uh, a number of us said that, hey, this was not a great for time for us to tackle this. So we were doing cut and paste with the years and you know changing them from document to document and really not making as big a shift as we might want to. So to go into the data and say, what ones were able to pull that off? And where did they shift their focus? Thank you. All right. So we talked about um, potentially looking at, um, sorry, I guess I could address the room and not you directly, Emily, um, looking at the cost, um, like per person served across the different kind of broad 
subject areas. So, you know, if it was an early literacy project, how much does, like how many people does $1,000 or $100,000 can get, get you so that you can compare across things. Um, we also talked about sampling potentially the uh, direct recipients of the services or whatever. So the libraries themselves or perhaps even users of the library programs, acknowledging that that would be very difficult, but that potentially that's where some of the most meaningful stories and information lie. And then um, something I'm interested in that I think is probably outside the scope of this, um, of this evaluation is to compare uh, libraries to like sort of the distribution of ARPA funds through municipalities and states because we were able to move things so quickly and I think make a big impact. How does that compare to say a municipality where like they've only sent 10% of their ARPA funds? I don't know what that would look like, but I think that that could be potentially a powerful tool for us in advocating for library funding. Great, thank you. And I don't want to share that I have any bias, but I feel like we moved funds pretty efficiently. Okay, who at this table? Okay, so we started out by saying we wanted to get bang for buck analysis, but how do you do that, <laughs> right? Um, so talking amongst us with four, just four states, we found out that it's completely different in what we were actually allowed to do with our funding. And that's very problematic because our hands are tied in many different ways with contracts, with state laws, with local interests. And then we also said it would be interesting to try to have an analysis that could actually attribute the outcomes to what we are able to do because we're not operating in isolation. And there are many other things that influence what the outcomes are. So it, that's a, always a very hard thing. We know that we're an influential part of it, but how? what percentage can we say is actually due to us? Um, so at our table, oh, I have to stand up. Okay, sorry. I'm Mary Lee, by the way. Um, I'm from Utah. Um, so at our table, we kind of talked about a few things. Um, we kind of went through each question and the, the first, part that we thought would be important would be to talk about what were the goals and the intentions. Um, and then the second part, um, were those goals and intentions met? And then finally, um, why was meeting those goals significant? And kind of talking about like the context of what was happening at the time. Because we talked a little bit about, um, you know, we did spend money on books. And well, why was that significant? Because there was this huge demand for online material when everything was closed down. And so just being able to, to put all that information in a way where it makes sense um, about the how the intention and how those goals were met and, and why it was significant. Sorry, I'm repeating myself. Thanks, that's all I have. That was great, thank you. All right, who over here? Okay, uh, oops, sorry. A lot of our um, stuff we discuss, you know, stakeholder interviews, because a lot of ours came down to things that would be best uh, discovered that way. The, the first thing we just talked about was how did this address, how did everything we did address the needs of the pandemic? Because otherwise it's like, well, why did you just throw all this money out there since it was pandemic response? One of the interesting things we said, what did, you know, asking the libraries, what did they hope this money would do for them that it didn't actually do for them? Um, you know, and are the items, you know, the items, the programs that were initiated, are they still being used? Is there lasting impact? You know, there is some things where there's services that came about through necessity that now people expect, like curbside. Um, and then as the pandemic wanes, you know, what's no longer needed? What can be set aside? And, uh, and also, we had sort of a, an unintentional expansion of government was I think how somebody put it at our table. You know, how is this, will these creative pr programs be sustainable and how are they going to pay for them? You know, is this going to shift onto the, the states, the counties, the, the local? So how, you know, where is this money gonna come from if this is going to be sustained? So it's all kind of, you know, is there a lasting impact and how do we keep it up? 
Um, I appreciate the sneak preview of the next group exercise that we have coming up. <laughs> All right, let's hear from our online people. So a couple of things, uh, there's more than four or five people online. And so it's more like 22. So this is a longer list. Um, we, I'm not gonna say the things cause we've already seen repeat topics already. So I'm not gonna repeat myself. Um, and I actually have to use the format cause I have three pages to look at. So uh, folks are interested in trends. Um, formula versus competitive grants, impacts of supply chain, um, short-term versus long-term needs, LSA, LSAA purchasing on behalf of libraries versus subgrants. Um, did people feel safer using library services as a result of the CARES or ARPA Act activities? Um, ROI, could digital projects be funded with E-rate instead of LSTA funds? Um, capture the flux of how libraries were responding to all the pandemic related issues. Were there negatives? Schools think the eBooks were so successful during the pandemic, they're rethinking their collection policies for print. Um, they would like an illustration of how invaluable libraries actually were during the pandemic and what they did. How would L SLAAs and subgrantees use funds differently? That would be interesting. Um, imp impact of building closures, uh, did virtual services reach the intended users? Sustainability, um, sus uh, spending on dispensable, dispensable items, how much, what, and then they were thrown away. That was brought up. Um, maintaining hybrid programming, is it worth it? Higher demand for subgrants across the board. People are coming out of the woodwork for more money. Um, <laughs> um, comparisons on populations affected pre, during, and post epidemic breakdown by age. One more page. Sorry. Half page. Um, are libraries more aware of IMLS and LSTA? I hope so. Um, did libraries not want pandemic or not seek out pandemic funding due to hoops? as far as applying or reporting. You're welcome. Yeah. Well done online. Yeah, impressive. Okay, who at this table? All right, so um, our first question would be, what was the lessons learned? Because when we get more money next time, then we know how to move forward. Um, also, success stories, if something is replicable and scalable, re reproducible, or a toolkit because y'all are doing different things than we're doing. And sometimes we would, we can learn from each other instead of having to all figure it out on our own separately. Um, so not just the qualitative questions, but the quantitative, both of them. Sometimes we get fixated on the numbers and not the rest of the story. We'd wanna ask that. We'd also wanna ask if things from the pandemic have changed what we're still doing. I think someone else already mentioned that online. So we got it, thank you. We talked about a couple different things. Um, we talked about trends, but we figured if you're coming into this, you probably have some preconceptions. So more of the like, oh, well, this didn't happen here and I expected it. Or like, why was this thing so popular? Um, we also were talking about um, getting stories from people. A lot of times it's very, it's easier to get the, um, the number data than the story data. So kind of digging in particularly with end users and getting their stories. Um, and then the other thing we think that we would probably want to look at is kind of state comparisons and uh, commonalities like this seem to come up in a lot of rural environments or looking at the differences between we're all resourced very differently. So, oh, that state had a lot of success. Well, that state didn't have, you know, six people each doing 20 things. So they're not pulled in a bunch of different directions. So kind of being able to see that and um, use that data to help with future funding. We um, came up with several things and a couple of them have already been discussed, like how is it sustainable? How is your state funding a problem, hindrance because of authorization appropriation? Legislature has to be in session. That shortens the time you have to use, your, use the funds. Um, and 
how did you measure success? How did, how do you, why do you call what you did a success? How do you measure that? Um, and also how can outcomes be easily measurable at the local library level? And look at any evaluation data if available, especially hard data, like if um, you purchase vehicles, how many miles were driven, you know, how your services have impacted more people, things like that. Great, you all are making my evaluator heart so happy. Okay, so what we discussed, I think, was um, maybe what we were looking in, especially if you do the subgrants themselves, um, just a broad survey of the subgrantees um, as to how that money was spent. Um, we also ta talked about, I mentioned how I thought it, oh, I'm sorry, I mentioned how um, I thought it should be more from like a pandemic itself standpoint to di differentiate it from the current like evaluation and stuff you're doing how did these funds affect the pandemic part stuff of it and then just um mainly i thought some questions about you know if we did it this way what could you have done differently from an sla standpoint like if you had this funding if you get it again what would be you learned from it that maybe you wouldn't have done it that way this time thank you this table. Well, we're last, so I get to say what everybody else said. So thanks. Um, no, um, uh, I, I guess I want to reinforce one thing that our table talked about is that short term, long term challenge, um, short term, easily tangible things you can buy, you can count, you can show, though there is a challenge with some of that. So how to ask for more context, especially for those kind of smaller expenditures from smaller libraries that are understaffed who might not have been able to track some things for you. But then that longer term approach, um, I know in Wisconsin, we took that approach for longer term structural improvement. So some questions might be, how was the library, uh, library ecosystem in your state more future resilient to support community needs in a future crisis? Uh, what collaborations or partnerships were developed that might have increased capacity for services and resources? And were there any things that you did with fungible impact? So we're, we did a database inventory because there's lots of databases being purchased by individual libraries throughout the state. Nobody knew what anybody was buying. We're finding things that are spread covering 80% of our population that are being purchased, you know, on a hundred different purchases where we might be able to do cooperative purchasing, save local money so they can address the staffing issues, which is really a huge thing we're seeing as an impact out of this. So what are some of those fungible impacts we also might be able to measure? Great job, everybody. Um, surprise you were all just being interviewed for the evaluator position you're all hired you can do the we'll just have you do it um that's really great actually uh you know i've i've been working on starting to draft this scope of work for about a week now and terry and i and the grants the whole grants to state team have been brainstorming what is it that we want to learn from the data what can we get back to you that's going to be useful? How can we make this evaluation successful? And I know that was a quick round of what could we possibly think of, but there were ideas in there that I hadn't even that hadn't even occurred to me. Um, and that's going to really help us shape something that's going to reflect data that's interesting to you, um, and you know more data that's interesting to us. So as the data lady, I loved that exercise. Okay. The second table discussion, we're going to do a little bit faster. We're going to do five minutes of discussion, and then we'll do the round robin report out, and we'll start in this corner of the room and go that way. Um, and some of you already started to answer the questions here. What programs, stimulus-funded programs, did you decide to keep permanent? And or this could also be operations. So. You know, did you do subgrants that you hadn't done before and you're going to continue to do that? Did you create an X type of position that you're going to keep? Um, and what did you stop doing as a result of the pandemic that you are not going to go back to? So this isn't what can we stop doing now that the pandemic is, we're on the other end of it. What did you stop doing because of the pandemic that in retrospect, you're deciding 
you're not going to go back to. Okay, so I'm giving you five minutes for this one, and then I will find you again and we'll do our report up. Okay, Jeff is going to get us started. So we can wrap it up. All right, here we go. Uh, yeah, we had a few things that we, um, that our table that we're going to keep going through um, the process. One is the hotspot program turned out to be very popular with people, and we expect that that's going to keep going. We also had um, meeting room spaces that were outfitted for um, virtual meetings and, and remote work, and we expect that that's going to be a thing that's going to move forward as well. There was... Um, also, somebody had mentioned that one of the components of some of the grant programs were the uh, applicants would have to attend mandatory in-person trainings, and we dropped those during the pandemic, and we don't see any compelling reason to go back to that. And also, obviously, remote work. I think that's the thing that, um, that will probably stay with us throughout the uh, moving forward. Did you have anything you stopped doing before the pandemic? Did you make it to that one? I did. I think I think it was just mostly that we stopped requiring people to have in-face meetings and uh, or required to do stuff in person. That we were able to open up to this more broad internet-based, worldly library stuff. Good technical term. All right, who at this table? So um, all of our ARPA and CARES Act money was subgranted. So uh, we didn't really, as a, a state library agency, enact any new programs that we're going to keep permanent or hire people who we would keep permanently. However, uh, Utah hired a part-time person to help out with CARES Act ARPA. And they think that part-time person is now going to be permanent. So there's that. Uh, and what did we stop doing as a result of the pandemic that you won't return to? And that's uh, the, uh, the office, basically. We're not in the office five days a week. So there's that. Okay, so uh, across the board here, we have stopped depending upon paper. Um, we're using Teams and online versions and making sure that there's a virtual option. Whereas before, if you couldn't participate in person, you didn't participate. And it's enabled a new office culture that has included restructuring and we all feel like we're more versatile and able to do things. I think, I think there are probably 20 plus virtual attendees who appreciate the inclusion of virtual opportunities for meetings. Who here? We talked about several similar things. Um, processes going digital, so no longer requiring paper applications or um, paper contracts, doing everything digitally now. Um, also online Zoom meetings for trainings, for cohort meetings, for grantees. Um, the monthly check-ins that a lot of our library development people do, that's all gone to Zoom and it really makes it more accessible and a lot cheaper. Um, we also, at our library, we hired a bicultural, bilingual uh, library development coordinator and that position was ARPA funded initially and that's been converted to a full-time state funded position, which is really great. Um, Another uh, two states that did subgrants with museums found that maybe the program, it was challenging to find the fit. Um, and so maybe not continuing that with this particular funding source going forward. That's really interesting, the museum partnership. That's your best stuff. <laughs> So uh, definitely the reduction in paper use of DocuSign uh, now instead of a lot of paper, um, as well as the hiring and retention of digital navigators uh, in, in their libraries to um, keep up 
uh, that initiative and as well as streamlining um, the audio ebook e and audiobook platforms um, across the many libraries in the state. That's another one. And I don't think we did anything that we stopped doing. So, so in terms of things that we decided to keep permanent, we talked about um, a lot of digital things like having Zoom meetings for directors or other staff across the state um, to allow everyone to participate, keeping that. Um, one of us started doing sub-grants and that's going to continue. Um, a program to purchase Kindles to close the digital divide is gonna continue beyond um, stimulus funds and digital navigator program um, in my state um, that we have now moved on to local funds, which is great. So we're gonna keep that. And then the one thing that we talked about um, that we had stopped before the pan or at the pandemic and has not come back yet is a small summer grant program in Michigan. All right, coming over to this table. Okay, we discussed a number of things. So some things um, we discussed uh, keeping at our table, eBooks, certainly in Mississippi, we had a little pilot project come out with uh, for eBooks across the state um, during the pandemic and it was a huge hit. So we're gonna keep that resource. Uh, we also discussed, uh, like you all, um, keeping the option for virtual programming or virtual meetings, things like that. Um, as well as in Puerto Rico, they had a uh, reading project, a reading uh, program for um, youth in their communities. They're going to keep that. Um, that's going to be one thing they continue on with. And some things that we are not keeping. Uh, we discussed uh, maybe phasing out the need for funding PPE since the pandemic generally is winding down, as well as what else? Oh, and um, in Puerto Rico, uh, one thing that the library provided was access to school databases or databases for the schools and other supplies for students uh, to complete homework and other um, educational tasks. They'll be phasing that out as well as the schools have their own budget. So, all right. Um, some of the things that keeping, um, Several of us have done weekly Zoom meetings that are now monthly Zoom meetings uh, with directors of public libraries. At the state library, we have managers meetings within the agency. And now that even though everybody's back in the building, we're still doing them by Zoom, just because it's a little, just a little more convenient. Um, in Arkansas, with the CARES money, we purchased uh, Learning Express for a year, and our parent agency, the Department of Education, is paying for the next three years for us. So we were able to leverage those CARES funds. And um, we also did the summer reading virtual platform, and we still have that, but the number of participants is dwindling, so I'm not sure how long that will continue. With the ARPA funds, we use that to set up a statewide virtual union catalog. Um, some of the things that are no longer being done is the hotspots. Um, several of the libraries started with the CARES Act funding the hotspots. They continued the funding with the um, ARPA, but now it's just not sustainable with the LSTA funds. And um, at Arkansas, we did sub-awards and we will not be doing sub-awards. <laughs> Unless, of course, there's a big pocket of money, then what else do you do? <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Um, some of the things we talked about, people have brought up, but similar things about um, some of the digital products, um, you know, databases that were really popular, like LinkedIn Learning, shifting funds around for that. Um, early literacy spending was another um, aspect that people are keeping in terms of stuff that um, we're not doing. Dial a story has started up, not, not going to keep doing that. Um, a couple of us had done the reading tracking software for libraries where we're no longer going to be doing that. Um, again, we're not doing a couple people not doing hotspot programs anymore and related to the subrecipient aspect. Um, similarly, states that haven't done it before will not be continuing it. Um, 
in my case in Massachusetts, we had done it before. Uh, what I learned from doing it is I'm not doing this without a grant management system. So we're in the process of doing that. So um, definitely for those of you who are like, I don't know how to do this. I did know how to do it. And I was like, I'm not doing this on paper anymore. So that's a great lesson learned. All right, one more table and then we have our virtual people. Ours was pretty much everything everybody else said, but um, there was a couple extra things. One of the things that we, um, some of the people in our states are continuing to do like a more of a train the trainer type stuff and mentor and mentee um, programs. And obviously um, the eBooks and virtual hybrid programming was big. And um, one of the states no longer allows pickups. They mail everything, even if they're close by, just because they gotten used to mailing things during the pandemic. And what we've stopped doing is in-person programming only. So there's more of a hybrid approach. And um, that's it. Cool. All right. Online folks. Hi. Um, not going back to work 100% or excuse me, not going back to work. Most of these folks are 100% remote. Um, they are keeping accessible youth collections. They're sort of split about subgrants. Most of them have offered them as a result of the ARPA funds, but some are keeping, some are not. Um, some are keeping them, but probably not at the same level or amount. They're keeping the People's Law Library, which I'm very intrigued about. Um, keeping subgrants and the coordinator is now a permanent position. Um, stopped working with hotspots due to the grant requirements and libraries were not maintaining the plans. There's a teen internship sub award that they're going to maintain. Dropped TV white space. Not understandable. Uh, got it. Um, I have a grants assistant. I hope to keep her forever. <laughs> Stop PPE grants. Keep SP, uh, SRP reader zone subscription. Um, broadband is now part of our five-year plan. Um, we've offered grants during ARPA, but we want to continue. Digital inclusion is a big thing that they want to maintain. Great job, everybody. Um, I know I got everyone hyped up about leaving for break early. We're right at the top of the hour, but uh, to let you out with inspiration on your brain, our, um, we have a surprise guest speaker who's just going to come up and give you a couple of great pep talks. Our man behind the money, uh, CFO Chris Catanani. Um, he's, uh, he's the one that makes sure that the lights stay on, the doors stay open, and you guys get your checks. So uh, Chris, did you want to um, come up here and just say a few quick things, and then we'll go to break. Thank you. Uh, I, I hate the fact that you put me in between uh, a great session and the break, but uh, guest speaker nonetheless. Um, really, I just want to climb back onto the soapbox that Emily set the platform for uh, so high. You guys set it high. Um, and I just want to give you some, maybe put some graphics into that soapbox. Is uh, So the CARES funding was emergency stimulus funding. So it was new to IMLS as well. And I remember it's almost what three years ago now that appropriation was passed and we had to struggle with what are we going to do with this money we had 50 million dollars and it was a um, leadership team got together the executives got together and had to figure this out and we had Terry the program officers from Grants of States who were leading the charge along with Cindy Cindy Landrum on setting some really flexible standards that the states absorbed and the states helped to get $30 million. Um, we were able to award and obligate the money, which was important because Congress wanted to know how much your CARES funds were obligated. We got 30 million out the door very quickly. And then let's keep moving along through the year back in 2020, they wanted to know how much is being spent and your organizations were spending the money. That made us look very good. Um, so Congress was inquiring when we had to start setting the budget for 22, 22 requests was going into place. We were able to talk to OMB and the president's administration about the obligating and the spending that was being done. 
And there is a very strong correlation between the work you did that got us the much larger ARP fund uh, in 2021. So we know the work's not done, but it was your efforts that got us to where we are. The evaluation's very important because, well, let me go back. We were leading edge in getting money out the door and spending money. So evaluations, we want to be leading edge in that too. We want to be first out the door. And what you're talking about now during this last half hour is really going to drive some important thoughts and help us write good narrative for future appropriations and requests. So keep it up. Um, we know the work's not done at the OCFO level because we're doing all the closeouts that you're sending in. Um, it's important work. And it's not going to stop. We're in a new reality now. And we need people that are on the ground seeing what's going on to help us get more money to you, to the communities, and help this nation. So keep it up. Terry, are you going to take us to break? We're going to break. Oh, go on break. Yeah, come back a quarter after. Thank you. couple of years that we have dealt with a lot of things that were unexpected, perhaps, maybe. Uh, things are a little bit, um, <laughs> something came out of left field that you weren't quite prepared for. And so, you know, we were thinking, um, this is a great opportunity to kind of take that memory of that sort of caught off guard feeling and, um, and try to think ahead, think about what could be done in the future um, to sort of do some, flex some scenario planning muscles, if you will. So that is what we're going to do tonight, this afternoon and then a second session tomorrow afternoon to do um, a couple of exercises in this realm. So what this really is, is scenario planning, another um, potentially more popular way of discussing it is um, futures and futuring. And so it really is about these three things here. Uh, making projections, being prepared, and actually planning in advance in the case that those kinds of things were to actually take place. And um, specifically, we wanted to, it's talked a lot about in a lot of contexts, IMLS in other capacities has supported um, future schools, um, future tra uh, training librarians to be futurists. Um, but we obviously, for the sake of time and to hone in on the purpose of our time together as LSTA coordinators, we wanted to hone in on the LSTA and state library contexts of scenario planning. So what we're going to do to this afternoon and tomorrow afternoon is have an opportunity to think ahead. Um, and we're hoping that by doing this, it can help you all anticipate changing roles of state libraries, LSTA coordinators, um, and think of how the work that is done in a state library um, can maintain its relevance no matter what may befall um, the world or the state or the country. So um, here's how the sections are going to be structured. Uh, I will break out the in-person attendees in three different groups. I'll, I'll do that in a second once I eye up the tables and who's at what table. Um, and then they'll be in three groups and you'll all have a unique scenario that we have come up with um, that takes place in the year 2040. And the virtual attendees will also have their own scenario to work through. They'll go to their own breakout room. Um, and I believe that they're providing the link to the breakout room in the chat. And, uh, and then each group will have a facilitator from IMLS to kind of help guide the discussion, answer any questions, um, kind of yeah, shepherd that conversation. And then what you'll be doing in this session is you'll have 30 minutes to um, first digest the scenario. So we'll have handouts so you guys can kind of process it. Um, and then there's a space where you can kind of make some individual notes about what you think the implications are for that. Um, and like as a group for the 20, right, remaining 25 minutes, you'll collectively consider the implications for the work of state libraries. Um, and then within that time, the 30 minutes, you'll identify a representative who will share a summary of the group's work when we come back together. And just as a reminder, 
the summarizing part is going to be helpful because you all have different scenarios. So um, just be thinking about that with the with the share out piece. So today um, we have again I mentioned uh, well first of all the breakout rooms have flip charts to gather and arrange your ideas. The um, IMLS representatives will also help with kind of gathering and organizing the thoughts and ideas that you'll be um, brainstorming. Uh, today's session, I in the Wizard of Oz theme, I would say is more of an alphabet uh, moment here. Uh, challenges, curveballs, uh, things that are not great happening. And then um, tomorrow's session is more of a Glinda time, where it's windfalls and wonderful things, the very positive things that would be happening in the future. Okay, and so another way too, especially if you're new to this sort of way of thinking, many of us are. We've, I know me personally, I've heard of this process. I haven't actually put my sink, my teeth into it before. So this is just one possible way to think through the implications of um, of what this means to libraries. Is called uh, organizing them by order of consequence. So we'll have um, different things you can jot down on your paper, etc., and you can organize maybe by the first order consequence, like if, if this thing were to happen, this is the first consequence. And then when that happens, then this consequence will take place. So it kind of allows your brain to organize a chronological cause effect of, of what this scenario would do to libraries and state libraries. And then we just, again, because this is very new kind of exercise, we have a couple of norms to put out there for everybody. Um, be open to new ideas. This is very much similar to a brainstorming environment where you kind of let things marinate for a while. Um, challenge your assumptions. Suspend disbelief is very important when you're talking about things that could happen in 2040. Um, staying future oriented. So really be thinking about, okay, this is what the scenario says. So I'm going to stay in that moment um, and fully participate by listening actively, contributing, um, really leaving space in the conversation for others. You may have, this may be something that comes really easy to you. You may have a, a ton of things to share, but kind of letting as many people kind of get comfortable with this conversation as possible and stay engaged, of course. Okay, so these are the breakout assignments. Madison will be in her namesake, the Madison Ballroom. So, um, so yeah, let me let me take a minute then to do these breakouts now visually. Um, let's see. I'm going to go with this table, this table, this table, and yeah, that should. Okay. Um, our scenario was that a sophisticated multinational cyber terror organization launches a coordinated cyber disaster in 2040 so all government systems worldwide have been targeted um some internet remains mostly uh for personal use not for government use connectivity returns at a snail's pace um and it's eight months it's completely uh completely limited and um then there's also an ever-present threat of more cyber attack. So we approach this as um, uh, it's, it feels a lot like a reverse COVID. So instead of taking everything online, we're bringing everything back to in person. So uh, library spaces become a lot more important. Um, we also were lucky enough to have um, Hector and Amy, it's Amy, right, um, who've experienced, not that they're, they're not um, but communities who have gone through hurricanes have experienced this similar loss of connectivity. And so there was a lot of talk about um, the sort of phone tree systems, the satellite phones, having fever backups of everything. And so we talked a lot about how um, we would need to maybe support libraries with paper, toner, physical resources. Um, and we thought about that there might be some supply chain issues around, as opposed to around technology this time, around, um, yeah, paper and toner and physical material. Um, we also talked about the security and facility risks. So if everything is on a, you know, key card, those will have to be repeat so that you can use locks. And how are we protecting our in-person spaces? Are we bringing security guards? Are people looting the buildings? Can anyone get in? Can everyone get in? Um, we talked a little bit about how this would disrupt funding completely. If your payroll is all online, if you're drawing down funds 
say for EGMS, you can't do that. So how are we accessing our funds? I also think we talked a little bit about in the wider scope what other services are out. So is water out, is banking out, like we don't like know, but we think a lot of critical services for people are probably also out. Um, and then talking a lot about being a trusted source of information. So as we're rebuilding, are we rebuilding the local intranets so that libraries can at least communicate um, within themselves online um, and also, you know, steering people in the correct direction as things begin to come online and making sure that they're safe. I did mention, like, maybe less resource safe libraries might be an advantage if we don't have those virtual systems in place. So if you're still doing your payroll by hand or in a non-cloud-based system, maybe it wouldn't be that, that bad, potentially. Um, yeah, and so just a big question of how does everybody get paid if the banking systems are down? Any, did I miss anything? I will say that yeah. um, they also mentioned, so SPR reporting came up in oh, ours yes, as well, that they can't be expected to do as much with the SPR report if it's all paper-based. Um, and yes, we would be not, receiving binders of, of paperwork from them. We're not very interested in filling them out by hand. <laughs> Thank you. So. <laughs> Thank you. All right, the third and final in-person group, and then we'll move on to the virtual group. Hi. So our scenario was that Congress decided to no longer fund any program or collections that would all be local issues, and we would go back to the LSCA system. And local libraries would be required to put up a 50% match, but we'd have a lot more money because we'd get $500 million. Um, that was each state, right? Yeah, yeah. So we'd be swimming in cash, but <laughs> it was kind of interesting because as we developed our ideas, especially around the implications, we started off with kind of doomsday negative things, and but at the end, we kind of came around to some positives. So we worried about a rich-poor divide because we thought that people who couldn't come up with a match wouldn't get money. But then later on, we said, well, maybe the state could be instrumental in how it was divided and it wouldn't necessarily have to depend just upon the local library. But we did think that aspirational projects would probably disappear. Um, consultants, library development type consultants would no longer be needed. I'm not sure if that was good or bad. <laughs> um, but we did think that smaller libraries would have a lot more difficulties. Um, statewide projects would be imperiled Mm -hmm. um, because unless the state decided to um, fund them without any federal funding, they would disappear probably as long. Um, the structure and award would probably have to go over a larger period of time because construction takes more time. In some cases, state laws would have to be changed because their current statutes wouldn't allow this program. Um, we think it would be very expensive. We'd probably end up paying a lot more. Um, it could be something that would be very popular with areas that were already very rich. Um, we said we would need more staff overall at state libraries because of different specialties that we're not really covering right now. And in any case, the staff would change. What the staff does and what their expertise is would have to change. So how would the money be divided and who would make the decisions? Would it be a better infrastructure or not? And then we also said five-year plan, whole new ball game, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we were asked to talk a little bit about the roles and we thought that there'd be a lot more compliance role for the director and that we'd probably need severe retraining for staff that could remain. Um, then we talked about distribution of the money and whether or not this money could be available to nonprofits that have libraries as well as to publicly funded libraries. Um, and it could be more equitable, but there's no guarantee that it would be more equitable. So it would be kind of more of a lottery across different states. People mm -hmm. could make up their own minds about how they wanted to do it. There would definitely be political ramifications. And then we kind of said, well, would it only be public libraries or would we also be funding school libraries or academic mm -hmm. libraries? So in that. 
So for jobs, we said that we would need lots of project managers. We would need labor compliance specialists. We would have to become experts in things like prevailing wages. We would probably need more lawyers for legal advice. And maybe a staff architect could be a great idea. Hmm. Good. That's Thank it. you. Thank <laughs> you. All right. And now for our virtual. Cindy's coming around. Climate change. Climate change is reaching catastrophic levels in the United States uh, in 2040. A third of the country is experiencing drastic permanent change of the landscape due to historic heavy rains and flooding. Entire swaths of the country are now uninhabitable and it's resulting in a mass relocation largely to the Great Plains. By 2045, it's projected that the majority of the United of the country has lived in their residence for a year or less. It's fascinating. <laughs> um, so I'm going to hit the highlights. I'm going to do my best. Um, we talked about for the implications for the state um, infrastructure was a big discussion because we've got a lot of folks coming into a much smaller section. Um, SLAA is helping the transient folks and continue to offer resources, obviously. All federal versus state funding is a possibility. Uh, the Great Plains states might create new states. I think this was something that um, someone else had mentioned, yeah. Um, library buildings as a building, a recon reconceptualize, possibly pop-up libraries, and connect with communities beyond jurisdictions. It would just be us, which I kind of like. Um, second question, how would the role of the LSTA coordinator change? Get rid of the SPR. <laughs> it was top. I'm sorry. It was top. I can't make this up. I, I swear to God. They, they did, they did mention possibly subcontracting that out. <laughs> um, they would, they would think that, um, a, a shorter year plan, like not a five-year plan, it would probably be an annual five-year plan. Mm -hmm. Um, we're still split on the grants. Some would like fewer, some would, some would like more. Mm. Um, LSTA coordinator responsibilities could be shared given the change in every, everybody's daily lives, especially the coordinators themselves, the worker bees. Um, and then how would funding be best utilized? Um, subgrants, mm. construction, <laughs> um, break down barriers for the subgrants. Um, address the potential homelessness that this mass migration is likely to bring about. Food insecurity. Operational funding. Ooh. Um, engagement specialists to help navigate uh, social agencies, uh, forms, things like that. Social services. Librarians going back to being Sherlock and research, prove who I am kind of folks, you know, if you need to track down a, a birth certificate or something like that. Yeah. Um, one central piece of ID, so one ID, and addressing the emotional well-being for library employees. Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> um, and then lastly, how what new title, titles would be emerge? Um, outreach positions, obviously, community engagement. Uh, someone suggested a four-day work week. Um, sure. Remote tech positions. I know those are hard to do. Um, I also mentioned circulation because I know that those folks are pretty, pretty married to that desk. Mm. Um, what do collections look like? Are there print materials? Mm. And my follow-up was statement was, gosh, I hope so. Um, social workers and if offering grants, make them non-competitive. Mm. Thanks, Dennis. Very good. Way to go virtual team. All right. Well, that was really, really interesting. I have to say, at least from our perspective, that that 30 minutes like flew by. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it was a really, really interesting discussion. And I, if you have any thoughts or observations about the process, um, just hold on to those because, like I said, tomorrow is a longer session where we'll go over nice things, um, wonderful things, and then we'll have some time to talk about the process in general and like what your thoughts were on that and how it could benefit you um, as you plan for the future. So good job, everybody. Um, and now I'm going to hand it over to Terry, who's going to um, begin the wrap up of day one. Thank you. 
And actually, I'm going to turn it over to another colleague of ours who's been dutifully helping the virtual team all day. So, Laura, why don't you make your way up as I'm introducing you? <laughs> Laura's been with IMLS for over six years and with our Grants to States team for about two and a half. And I think we all agree that we just don't know what we'd do without her. I mean, she tracks thousands of things for us on an annual basis. She keeps us all organized across the portfolios. She has been instrumental in getting all your web profile pages updated because she's got access to the website now. And um, she's just generally wonderful. So she's getting to do the wonderful part of the day, which is to do the recognition of all of you. And we're also going to pull Cindy Boyden out from behind virtual screens. So it's me for a moment. I'm going to hop in there and just hold down the fort and maybe Emily's in there too. Um, so, so don't, don't dismay. We're, we've still got some IMLS peeps on the virtual side, but um, Laura, come on up and get us started. Oh, well, thanks so much, Sherry. Uh, first of all, just a couple of announcements uh, before we do the awards. Uh, at six o'clock, the program officer office hours with Madison Bowles and Cindy Boyden will be here in this room, uh, plus the south room on the third floor for Dennis Nangle. And we will use the same rooms uh, for tomorrow morning's office hours, and the sign-up sheets are in the registration uh, area for reference. And if you signed up for dine arounds, uh, you might want to meet your group uh, here by the easel uh, when we're finished uh, to coordinate. And if you had any parking lot questions, uh, we can start off day two by addressing those. And also remember the peer-to-peer -peer appreciation wall as well. And now for the fun part, <laughs> uh, recognition. So every year, uh, we really look forward to celebrating you all based on different achievements, um, some of which are you know, pretty mundane part of our program, but are very important to us. Uh, we are going to have several of our award recipients participating virtually. So they won't be able to come up and get a group photo uh, like we often do, but we will acknowledge them all the same. And I especially want to thank Dennis Nangle uh, for spearheading so much of this and creating the lovely certificates. I also want to disclaim that no federal funds were used in the creation of these prizes. Uh, we have certificates. <laughs> And an emerald colored candy for each of you uh, if you're in person. And we'd like you to stay here at the front of the room uh, with your fellow uh, award category winners for a group photo. Um, as you know, our theme is Emerald City. Uh, so with that in mind, we will kick it off with the Over the Rainbow Award. Uh, this award recognizes states who were the first in each of the three program officers' portfolios to submit their interim FFRs ahead of the December 30th deadline. So to kick it off with Wyoming, I believe we have uh, Susan Mark and Jessica Otto in person. Congratulations. And North Carolina, uh, Catherine Prince, also in person. And Alabama, I believe they're virtual, Kellen Ralia. <laughs> And we also wanted to note that Wyoming and North Carolina submitted before anyone else with mid-October. And Alabama was close behind in early November. So great job. Yeah. Okay, next up is the Yellow Brick Road Award uh, for states that got their signed certifications down the Yellow Brick Road faster than everyone else. Uh, these are the annual certifications that states need to submit within 10 days of receiving their annual award. And we have three states from each portfolio for this one. So I'll start with Madison Bowles. 
Uh, and the first one is Connecticut. They are virtual. Congratulations. And next up is Maryland. Uh, I know we have some in-person attending, Mary and another Laura. <laughs> And Maine, uh, we have uh, Jenna Davis, who is virtual. And next up, uh, Cindy Boyden's portfolio, uh, Nebraska, Sam Shaw, virtual. Uh, Virginia, we have some in-person attendees here, Kim and Wendy, I believe. And Utah, I know we have Rachel Cook virtual and Marilee Cannon. And now for Dennis, uh, New Jersey, uh, Maura Walsh. And Idaho, uh, I believe Talela is here, yeah. And last but not least, Missouri. Any? <laughs> and next up is the Ruby Slipper Award. Yep. And this is for showing us that before anyone else, that there's no place like your home state, uh, that we're recognizing the first states to submit slides for the lightning talk session. And once again, uh, Connecticut uh, is first, <laughs> virtual. Uh, next up, Montana, uh, Rebecca. and followed by Missouri. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. All right, thank you. Uh, the Lionheart Award. Uh, these states submitted their ARPA and allotment reports together on time in the SPR uh, within 120 days of the September 30th uh, end period of performance. And since almost every state came in for an extension, uh, this is especially noteworthy. Um, once again, by portfolio, I'll start with Arkansas. And Alabama, on your virtual. Missouri. <laughs> Again, <laughs> Tennessee, <laughs> and Louisiana. <laughs> Yes, Cindy. Yes, sorry. Uh, Cindy is uh, Wyoming. <laughs> and, and South Dakota.
Massachusetts. And Florida, I know we have a couple uh, online participants, Amy Johnson. And, and Madison States, Rhode Island. And Arizona. <laughs> Great. All right. And now we have the Oscars, Oscars, or People's Choice Awards. Uh, you all had an opportunity to submit nominees uh, via the conference registration form, and we have a great slate. Starting with uh, Maura Walsh of New Jersey, nominated by Karen Reich of the Library of Michigan. <laughs> and Jamie Ball of Arizona, uh, not also nominated by Karen Reich. <laughs> Amanda Gammon of California, nominated by Michelle Killian of the California State Library. <laughs> and Evan Strubel of Ohio, uh, nominated by Jeff Regensberger. <laughs> And Karen Reich of Michigan uh, had a couple nominators, Jeff Rensenberger of the State Library of Ohio, Shannon Furlow, Georgia Public Library Service, and Kellen Ralia from Alabama. <laughs> and Erica McCormick uh, was nominated by Rachel Cook from Utah. And Rachel said that Erica McCormick always has the best answers and provides them with the right amount of humor to help ease the stress of the situation. I always appreciate her input. And next, uh, Wendy Copeland of South Carolina. Uh, she was nominated by Jeanette Schaefer of Vermont. And Jeanette said that Wendy is is nominated because she's the best mentor ever and she's always available with good advice, a listening ear, and great questions. And finally, uh, Rachel Cook of Utah, who is joining us virtually, uh, she was nominated by several of you uh, Terry Blavelt, uh, Tamara Autumn, Marilee Cannon, Alexandra Sanders, Maura Walsh, who said without a doubt the fabulous Rachel Cook from Utah. Wendy Copeland said Rachel Cook from Utah is always so helpful. And Claire Imumara from Washington State Library, who said whenever I have an LSTA question, I look to Rachel Cook's guidance. It's comprehensive, easy to understand, and publicly posted. And there are also two nominees who can't join us today in person or virtually, but we wanted to recognize them too. Uh, Mary Jean Haver of Puerto Rico, uh, nominated by Hector. And Shannon White of Michigan, nominated by Jeanette Schaefer. Uh, Jeanette said that Janin, uh, Shannon White uh, for facilitating our development director meetings faithfully every Friday for three years. And Shannon was also nominated by Evan uh, from the State Library of Ohio. All right. And this concludes our Emerald City recognition for the year. Uh, those participating in the optional state networking activity should stay here in the ballroom. And we've asked to keep the cameras on for this portion. And 
We're also going to put up a directional slide for office hours for the people in the room. We appreciate you and we'll look forward to seeing you again tomorrow.